sort of witnessing and celebrating the marriage of James Bailey, uh, Mark and Karen's son. I know many of you here um, know him and have loved him over the years. And actually, I thought I'd just bring a, a few home photos this morning to show you what was happening in HTB yesterday. So I've just got, there they are, making their vows. You can see Mark hiding behind James. He's marrying them. That's the exchanging of the rings. It was very emotional. <laughs> they both cried, actually, while they were making their vows. So they shared this tissue at one point. It was, it was very lovely. Uh, very special. Yeah, very special. There you are, they're man and wife. They were very excited. Very special day. And uh, full of so much joy and love. And there they are coming out of the church. She looked beautiful. James looked amazing. It was, uh, well, it was just fantastic to see somebody we've known. You know, I've known him since he was six. You know, walking down the aisle with his bride. Fantastic. Anyway, we, uh, as, as Tim said, we're starting this, uh, we started last week this uh, new series, Freedom Calls, that for those of you who were here last week, Mark was talking about our past affecting our present. And this week, we are talking about, we're thinking about the subject of restoration. Now, I don't know what you think of when you hear that word restoration. When I uh, saw it first, I thought, oh, that reminds me of the restoration man. Has so anybody watched The Restoration Man on Channel 4? It's a, it's a, as I don't watch it very often, but I have seen it. It's about this chap, uh, well, it's not about this chap. There is this chap who claims to be a passionate architect who's committed and feels very strongly about passionate, um, the renewal of architectural heritage. And uh, he finds people who've bought these old houses and old buildings that have some kind of history and beauty about them and they restore them and they turn them into these beautiful homes and then they live in them. And of course, you know, the TV uh, company turns it into very good viewing. And uh, then I thought, when I was thinking about this word restoration, I thought, well, the other thing I associate it with is my lounge, where my children have groups of friends over and fill it with food and people and move the furniture around. And then all I find myself saying when, it, when they've all left is, can you put it back to how it was? Can you restore it? I don't know what you think of when you hear the word restoration, but I think, you know, for all of us, if we were to think about it, we would associate it with the concept, wouldn't we, of, res of, of turning something back to, putting something back to its former condition, what it was originally, whether, it's, whether that something is something that's been interfered with or that's been broken or that's been damaged, you know, like a home or like a, a relationship, like a marriage, like a, um, I don't know, any kind of scenario, a car, you might take your car to the garage, uh, it's been dented and, and you, you ask for the guy to restore it, to put it back to how it was, you know, before you, you crashed it or whatever. It might be, we might think about it in terms of restoring something to us that's been taken, that's been stolen. Uh, something that we used to, uh, when, we were, when the kids were a bit younger, they used to have a jar on the side in the kitchen that they would keep their chocolate in. And on desperate evenings, Tim and I would go and raid the jar and the chocolates. <laughs> because going out to the shop was just a little bit too much hard work. And then the next day, we'd have to restore the chocolate. We'd have to go and get some and restore it to its place so that, uh, you know, the kids weren't any the wiser. They're a bit too old for that now. And, uh, you know, sometimes we might associate it with restoring something that's been lost. We hear often, don't we, on the news that the government are trying to restore our confidence in the housing market or restore our confidence in the economy. Um, you know, it's something that we link with, with putting something back to a condition that it was in uh, previously. And as I've thought about this word, I felt God challenging me again that actually as people of his, as children of his, we need to be people who have a restoration mindset. That actually it's crucial as followers of his, if we don't have one and don't live with one already, that we develop and that we have a restoration mindset. What's that? It's a way of looking at ourselves, at our circumstances, at the scenarios that come along and, you know, just contend with us as we do life, that we have this mindset that expects and that believes for and that but contends for restoration. Because we're, we're children of his, we belong to the heavenly father and he, his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways are not our ways and he is a God who is passionate about restoration. He thinks and he acts and he pursues restoration. And if we're to have the mind of Christ, then that's a mindset that we need to have too. I sometimes say one of my favorite verses, Proverbs 4, 23, you know, which says, be careful how you think because your thoughts run your life. You know, the, the way we think 
influences how we experience and what we, what we go on to see in life. Be careful how you think because your thoughts run your life. And God wants us to have a restoration mindset. So take your circumstances. We all experience loss of some kind, of, some kind or other as we go through life. You know, we tend to associate loss with uh, the loss of a loved one. But actually loss comes in all different forms and different shapes and sizes, doesn't it? So, you know, we might think of loss in terms of just the quality of a relationship, you know, it might have been in, you know, a close, effective, loving relationship at one point in time, and we might experience loss as that relationship deteriorates, or maybe people that we love become distant for us, from us. We might experience loss in terms of an opportunity that was there one day and is gone the next. We might think of loss in terms of a reputation, you know, a job, a dream. You know, many of us I know testify to the fact that, that, that at one point in time we had, we had dreams, we had passions, and that, that over time we've lost them. We might associate loss with our health, with a load of money. We might, ne- we might acknowledge a loss of hope, a loss of peace, a loss of joy, a loss of fulfillment, a loss of intimacy, a loss of connection with God. And sometimes that's because of other people's choices, p- choices that people alongside us have made. You know, your spouse walks out on you and actually... You know, that's a choice that they make and there's not a lot you can do about it. Somebody who owes you money refuses to pay you. Somebody slanders you and damages your reputation. It's somebody else's fault. Somebody does you wrong. And what we experience is at the hands of someone else. Sometimes it's because of our own choices. We make bad choices. We know that. We make bad choices. We let, we let the wrong kind of people influence us. We develop bad habits. You know, we make mistakes. Maybe we do things that we shouldn't have done or we don't do things that we know actually we should have done. We all know what it's lived like to live with that voice of regret, don't we? That voice that says it's your fault. You know, the if only. If only you'd done this or if only you hadn't done that. If only you'd been stronger. If only you'd spent more time with the kids. If only you'd worked harder. You know, if only you'd made such and such a choice. And then there are times where we experience loss, don't we? And it's nobody's fault. It's not somebody else's fault. It's not my fault. You know, you're going along, you're trying to follow the Lord and suddenly you've got a health issue and you lose an element of your health or your function or whatever. Or you lose your job because your company's suddenly going under. Or you lose, you know, your, your, the possibility of having a baby and you suddenly discover it's not possible. And it's nobody's fault. It's not your fault. It's not somebody else's. And of course, you know, these occasions, these scenarios, they're hugely challenging to deal with. And we become vulnerable, you know, to disappointment and discouragement and despair, don't we? As we, as that sort of hope and and, and confidence in life, how it was, sort of evaporates. But as God's children, it's in times like these that I believe God wants us to hold on to or develop or live from this mindset of restoration, that it might sustain us and keep hope alive in us for what God wants to go on to do, because he is a God of restoration. He's passionate about restoration. The gospel is all about restoration. He's always looking to restore. He never said we wouldn't have unfair situations. He never said that life wouldn't dish the dirt on us. He never said that we wouldn't experience loss and that difficulty wouldn't come our way. But he promises to restore. He promises that if we will trust him, he will restore what we have lost. He promises to restore what we've lost. He doesn't necessarily set a time frame on it and he doesn't necessarily say how that restoration will happen. But he promises to bring us out better than we were before we experienced that thing that has caused us pain. Because the idea in the Bible, here's the thing, the idea about restoration in the Bible is not about returning something back to its former condition, like I might want my lounge to be restored. God always promises to bring more good and to restore us to a place of, a, a, restore us to a better place. You get restoration, but you also get the notion of compensation as well. You know, God always promises to bring us out better which in many scenarios seems absolutely impossible to believe. But what kind of God do we believe in? Do we believe in a God who is limited by our scenarios? So I've decided to call this morning, Restoring Forwards, because God restores us always 
onto something better rather than back to how things were before. Don't just take my word for it. I'm just going to read you a, a whole load of verses where God is revealing his heart for restoration for us. You know, his heart and his passion and his commitment to restoration. So here they are, a whole load of verses. Psalm 51, the psalmist is inspired by the Holy Spirit to cry out to God for what God promises. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Maybe that's something some of us need restoring to us today. The joy, the joy of our salvation. Psalm 71, the psalmist says, though you've made me see troubles, you will restore my life again. He's got a restoration mindset. You will restore my life again. Joel 2, 25, Joel says, you know, articulating what God is saying, I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. That's about time. That's about, you know, content. That's about the richness of life. I will restore to you what the locusts have eaten. Um, Mark was talking last week about Joseph. You know, 12 years he was in jail, had so much taken from him. Walked through so many years of difficulty and yet overnight God restored him. God restored him actually to a place better than he was before it all began. He was restored to this position in Israel where he was the se- uh, in Egypt where he was the second most influential person. He was restored to his family that he'd been disconnected from. The restoration was phenomenal. I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. Maybe you feel like you've had time stolen from you. You've had opportunities stolen from you and your moment has gone. Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may return, that uh, Jeremiah cries in Lamentations 5. Jeremiah 33, this is God saying, I'll never never abandon the descendants of Jacob or David. Instead, I'll restore them to their land. There's his heart again. I'll restore them. That's my commitment to my people. I'll restore them to to their land and have mercy on them. Jeremiah 30, he says the same kind of thing. The time is coming. The time is coming when I'm going to restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. Psalm 85 kind of confirms it. You showed favour to your land, O God. You you did restore the fortunes of Jacob. Zephaniah 2.7, another fantastic promise. The Lord their, their God will care for them. His people, he will care for them. He will restore their fortunes. That's not just talking about money. It's opportunities, prospects. He will restore their fortunes. Job 42, when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. There's that notion again of God restoring us forwards to something better. You know, we often hear Job sort of talked about in the context of suffering and he suffered incredibly. He was tested by the Lord. But the the story of Job ends with Job's restoration. And he ended up with twice as much as he had before. It's important that we remember that about that story. Zephaniah 9, fantastic. One of my favorite promises, 9.12. Return to your fortress, O prisoner of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. There's that promise again. I will restore twice as much to you. Zechariah 10, I will restore them because I have compassion on them. That's God's motive for restoration because he has compassion on us. 1 Peter 5.10, and the God of all grace, after you've suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong. Acts 3.21, talking about Jesus, he must remain in heaven until the time comes for him to restore everything. That's part of God's plan, to restore everything. You know, in Jesus' kingdom ministry, the signs of the kingdom, they were always about restoration, health, bodies, life, you know. Jesus demonstrated signs of restoration. And lastly, in Mark 10, which is a kind of choice to lose things rather than stuff being, you know, taken against our will. Mark 10, 29, Jesus is saying, I say to you, there's no one who's left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake. There's no one who's done that 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 won't receive a hundred times, a hundred times as much now in this present age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and farms, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. God's heart for us, for every one of us in here, is for restoration. And it doesn't matter whether what you have lost, what we might have lost, what might have been taken is either my fault, your fault, somebody else's fault, nobody's fault. God doesn't make distinction. He's a God of mercy. 
He has compassion on his people and restoration is on his heart. As I said, he doesn't put a timetable on it. He doesn't say exactly how it's going to happen, but he's committed to restoration. Very small example of this. A number of years ago, um, when uh, we were called to Cheltenham and Tim got a job in, uh, at Cheltenham College and became a, ha- uh, a teacher there and we were given some accommodation to live in. And so we moved from Rickmansworth where we lived and had a, had a house and uh, we moved and we put the house sort of on the rental market and got some tenants in it. And the, the kind of characters that we live, uh, that ended up living in the house, obviously we didn't know. We thought they were good eggs. They turned out not to be. They were swindling the benefits people. They ended up swindling us and lying to us. And, the, you know, it was a long story, but they ended up owing us, you know, thousands of, uh, of pounds. And in order to get them evicted from the house, we had to involve bailiffs. And that requires going to court and, you know, nightmare of all kinds of shapes and sizes. And uh, once the, the procedure was going through the courts, he decided to disappear, ditch his job, because then nobody could trace him. And my dad, who was absolutely livid on behalf of his daughter, was threatening to hire private detectives. You know, I think it was probably a good thing for this chap that actually he did go underground, because I don't know, you know how it, the story might have unraveled. But, you know, we felt, you know, we felt really hard done by. We felt abused, we felt cheated, you know, and actually... A lot of money that was owed to us, you know, showed absolutely no prospect of ever being returned to us. But actually, it was in that moment, that challenging moment of deciding, what do we do here? Do we pursue this? We have a legal right to pursue it. And we we sat with God and we prayed about it. And it was, you know, it was God's heart of restoration for us that actually released us to forgive them, to offer them mercy by letting the whole thing go, knowing that actually we wouldn't end up worse off because God's heart is a heart of restoration. And actually, I don't know how it happened. You know, I don't keep track of these things, but actually over the following couple of years, we just ended up with money coming our way out of the blue, you know, and God restored to us what had been stolen. He is a God of restoration. And actually he has given us these promises of restoration. You know, they're a bit like Tesco vouchers. You know, he's put them into our hands. They're there in his word and we're meant to take hold of them and take them to God in order to see him cash them in. God, you've promised to restore twice as much. You've promised to restore. You know, he wants us to be real about our circumstances, but he wants us to stand as we walk through life on the firm ground, you know, the solid ground of his promises to us and his heart for us because that's where, when the storms come, you know, that's where our hope and our comfort comes from. But actually, what I, we're going to talk about specifically just in these next few moments is not the kind of restoration of, of, of things that have come against us or things that have, have, have gone from us or, or whatever, but about the restoration of us ourselves, of you and me. Now, you might not feel like you know, you're in a place where you need much restoring at the moment. You might feel like, well, you know, life's quite tickety-boo. You know, the sun's shining. I'm feeling pretty good about where I am and what's going on in my life at the moment. And, you know, hey, I'm not sure that this notion of restoration really kind of connects with me. It doesn't kind of quite describe where I'm at right now. But actually, that's not what God says about us. That's not what God says about us. Our God, who is passionate about restoration, is wanting to do you know, more restoration in your heart and in your life at this point in time. Now, I want you to just bear with me a moment. I sometimes have a few crazy ideas and I decided this morning that I needed a sort of Blue Peter moment, a bit of a Blue Peter opportunity. So I thought I would bring along this little prop here. This is a mirror. Oh gosh, it's very dusty. (laughs) It's the best way of looking at yourself in a mirror. If it's really dusty, you don't see the (laughs) the full picture. So this is a mirror, and uh, this rep- mirror represents, you know, just imagine that it represents you and me. You know, the Bible says we know that we're created in the image of God, and God is spirit. So it's that spirit part, that inner man part of us that is uh, created in his image. And uh, when Adam and Eve were created, they were created to reflect the glory of God. They were created in his image. Their spirits were connected to their bodies, but their spirits were also connected to God in unhindered you know, relationship and fellowship with him. And so because of that connection, because of that sort of purity of relationship with him, they lived in total security. 
They knew that their needs would be provided for, so they just didn't have any. They went to bed at night, they didn't worry. I mean, can you imagine that? Never worry. Ne- lying in bed at night, never going through the day in your, your mind and thinking, well, if only I'd done this differently or what would have happened if this hadn't happened. They knew that everything they needed would be provided for because of the safety that they knew in God. They had significance. They knew who they were in him. They were significant. They knew they had a purpose. God had given them this purpose to rule over the earth. And so they didn't have to go looking for a purpose or trying to create their significance. They knew their significance in God. And they knew intimacy with God because they were connected with him. They knew intimacy with him and they knew intimacy with one another. They had, they had incredible quality of relationship. And in that place of being formed in God's image, they reflected his likeness, his goodness, his character, all that God was and his rule over the world. And then we know that they ate the apple. It's not, great. It's not going to break, is it? I'll clear it up. That's what happened. When they ate the apple, the image of God was broken in them. The image of God was broken in them and their connection with God was shattered. And they began to experience a whole pile of negative emotions, of guilt, of fear, of shame. Their relationships with each other were broken and they hid they hid from God. And no longer did they reflect God's goodness. No longer did they know their significance. No longer did they know their purpose. No longer did they feel safe. The image of God was broken in them. But from that moment, God had a plan to restore them because he's passionate and committed to restoration. They'd lost everything. They'd lost intimacy, they'd lost their peace, they'd lost their hope, they'd lost their sense of acceptance, their sense of freedom, their sense of power. And you know, every one of us is born like that broken mirror. We are all born broken, with broken spirits that are disconnected from God. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we try, because we have this sense of knowing what we were made for, we try to kind of find our own way back to restore ourselves and to try and find our way back to what we were created to be, what we were originally intended to be. It's what a lot of the self-help books are about. But God is the expert. We cannot restore ourselves. God is the one who will restore us, who who will put us back together, as it were, as we were intended to be. Once that that process begins, when we put those pieces of broken glass, when we acknowledge that's what we're like and we put them in God's hands. But like I said before, God doesn't restore us to what we were originally. The notion of restoration in the Bible is about God restores us forwards into something more beautiful, more incredible, more magnificent than what was there before. Now, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, well, Lord, you know, if that's a smashed mirror all over the place... (laughs) What would you make then? What would you make then with a load of pieces of mirror? Because you wouldn't just fix them back with glue, you know, so it looked like a puzzle with lots of lines across it. What would you do with it? And I felt the Lord whisper to me, I'd make a glitter ball. And I've brought one along here. Borrowed from my friend. That's what God makes. That's what God is intending and working towards making with each one of us. Something more magnificent because actually it reflects the light and the glory and the beauty of God on every side, on every angle. You know, there's there's something incredible about it and it's incredibly beautiful. And God is in the process of wanting to restore us all to, as it were, being glitter balls. And we can resist that process or we can surrender to it. And God will love us just the same, whether we resist it or whether we surrender to it. But I know what I'd rather be. I'd rather be a glitter ball. So let's just look briefly in the Bible at what I think is a beautiful example of how this process happens on an ongoing basis. Because this isn't a one-off thing. 
It's an ongoing process that takes us the, 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 the length of our lives. We've got eternity. But this is a, a beautiful story of how it happens. And I'm going to read to you part of Peter's story. It's from the Gospel of John at the end of uh, chapter 21. It will be familiar to many of us. And uh, it's a story that we will know quite well. Peter was one of the 12 disciples. He loved Jesus. He was a passionate character, very impetuous. I love him because uh, I love, well, I identify with so many aspects of his character. And the way Jesus deals with him is always so beautiful and so gracious. It gives me so much encouragement and hope. And uh, on the night before Jesus was going to be crucified, he's having his kind of last moments with Peter. And he says to Peter, do you know what? Before the cock crows this evening, you are going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, no, no, Lord, I love you so much. I'm such a passionate, committed follower of yours. That's never going to happen. And, and Jesus says, Satan's asked to test you and you are going to deny me three times. And I think Peter just thinks, you know, Jesus just hasn't got me, but that's okay. You know, I'll show him. And uh, Jesus is arrested. And then Peter has this kind of, these moments where he's on his own and he's, he's, he's questioned by a couple of slave girls. And then he's questioned by some bystanders. Do you know Jesus? Do you know this character? And he's like, no, no, I don't know him. And then suddenly the cock crows three times. And Peter realizes that actually what Jesus had said he was going to do has come true. And the story says that he wept bitterly. And he goes back off to his fishing, no doubt, you know, in many ways very discouraged because his friend Jesus is crucified the next morning. Uh, Jesus remains in the tomb for three days, come back, comes back to life. And then this is where this part of the story uh, comes in. The boys, the disciples, they've gone off fishing. They don't have a, a very good night. They don't catch any fish. Jesus shouts from the shore and they don't recognize who he is. They say, go back and get your nets out there. And uh, they come in with uh, some fish. And I'm going to read from verse 11. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dropped the net ashore. It was full of large fish. And uh, just lost my place. 153 of them. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself. You went where you wanted. But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. And, Peter, and uh, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, the same thing that he said to Peter when he first met him, follow me. So what does this passage you know, illustrate to us about this process of restoration that actually God is doing in our lives or wanting to do on an ongoing basis? We need to be able to see our brokenness. We need to be able to see it. God will use our everyday life, the stuff that happens, the stuff that just comes our way to expose, to show us the broken pieces in our hearts and lives. We uh, had, had lunch years ago in um, the Bailey's kitchen when big old six foot four James was still living at home and uh, we, we were walked into the kitchen for lunch. All the chairs were sitting around, the, you know, tucked under the table, uh, as you would expect. And uh, they all looked the same. They all looked very normal. And then we all sat down for lunch. And James was sitting on a particular chair that as he sat down, I don't know how much he weighs, but the entire chair collapsed beneath him. It was most, well, it was quite funny for the rest of us. I don't think he was hurt because he was such a strapping lad. But what had happened was that there was a crack in the chair that nobody had seen and nobody had noticed until James put his weight on it, and the chair couldn't take the pressure any longer. And actually, that's what pressure does, doesn't it? It exposes the cracks in our lives, the cracks in our hearts, the cracks in our mindsets, the cracks in our attitudes. It's like God showing us with the pressures of life, you know, here's a piece, 
Here's a broken piece that I want to do something with. And we don't have to go looking for this stuff. Life will just throw it at us and God will use it to see what is really in us if we want to see it. You know, Peter was, had this expectation that he was going to do this great thing. He was deluded about himself. And actually what he really needed was to be put in a situation where he could see what was really going on in his heart. And actually, I'm like Peter, and so are you. And we have blind spots. We have a phenomenal capacity, actually, to deceive ourselves. We don't see the cracks. We don't see the broken places. We don't see the stuff within us that actually God wants to do something with. So he allows life to come at us. And if we want to see it, we don't need to look very far. You know, we don't tend to go around, do we, asking each other, what are my blind spots? What do you think about me? <laughs> Where do you think my weaknesses are? Where do you think I struggle? And it's not the kind of conversation we have over coffee, is it? And actually, probably if we did do, I don't think we'd probably believe what, what's, you know, if I asked you, I don't know that I'd believe what you said to me. Because Peter didn't believe what Jesus said to him. That was the son of God who knew him and had spent three years with him, but Peter didn't believe him. And we have that same capacity to deceive ourselves. So something like a giving campaign, well, it's really useful. Because when Mark starts asking for money, actually, if I want to see it, I can look in my heart and start realising, oh, I'm not as generous as I thought I was. Or there's fear there because... I don't want to sort of intuitively start writing out big checks or whatever. When somebody does something to us or says something about us that offends us, you know, if I want to, if I want to go there, if I want to look at it, I can see the cracks that actually I'm not as good at forgiving or as quick to forgive as I thought I was. Life takes an unexpected turn. Situations turn out differently to what we were anticipating. And suddenly I have the opportunity to see scepticism or doubt, or fear in my heart that I might have thought wasn't there before those scenarios. I, uh, I thought I was quite a nice person until I had kids. Then I, then I had four of them. And actually, I've had to come face to face with lots of aspects about who I really am that if you'd asked me before I'd had children, I would have said, no, I'm not like that. I think I'm quite a patient person until I get in the car and start driving around Cheltenham at rush hour time. And you know... <laughs> You haven't been with me, Josie. <laughs> but, you know, suddenly there's an awful lot of impatience and lack of grace in there in my attitudes to the people that drive in a really rubbish way around town. <laughs> and for Peter, the pressure came in the form of these, these characters, these servant girls and these bystanders just asking him a simple question at a slightly tricky time in his life. Do you know Jesus? It's like, there was the pressure, exposing the crack, no no, I don't know him. I don't know him and I've never been with him. And in that moment, his fear, his unfaithfulness, his lack of trust, his lack of courage, it was exposed for him to see if he wanted to. And I love the fact that Jesus had prophesied that this was going to happen. Because whilst Peter didn't believe him at that moment, I'm sure retrospectively, it was massively encouraging for him. Because Peter had the opportunity to think, gosh, Jesus knew this about me. I didn't know it about me, but Jesus knew it about me. And he loved me anyway, and he stuck with me anyway, and he's for me, and it didn't change the way he felt about me. Jesus had seen the cracks long before Peter. And he will use, and he does use, life's everyday scenarios to expose the bits of brokenness, the bits of broken mirror that he's wanting to pick up and put into that glitter ball. So we must see our own brokenness. We must also own it. You know, it's one thing to see something. It's another thing to put your hand up and go, yeah, that's me. And actually, this restoration process, it's a partnership. It's not some kind of surgical operation that God does on us while we're under the anaesthetic asleep or some magic wand that he waves over, uh, waves over us. It's a process that we're invited to cooperate within him. And if we're going to be restored to that glitter ball, to all that God has for us, all that he intends for us to be, we have to cooperate with the process and get real about ourselves and be real with our, about ourselves with God. 
Many things have been said about this passage and about this dialogue that Jesus has with Peter and why he, he asked him three times and, you know, do you love me? And, you know, um, many of you will know that the first two times Jesus is saying, Peter, do you agape love me? Do you love me in that sacrificial, costly way? And Peter replies, no doubt in the light of what's happened, Lord, I love you in a brotherly way. And then the third time, Peter, Jesus says, would you love me in a brotherly way? And Peter goes, yes, I do. But I don't know that that, that sort of questioning three times is merely about Jesus erasing the three denials and restoring him. Because if that was the case, it wouldn't say that Peter was hurt. But Peter was hurt by the third time that Jesus asked him that question. And I think it's because the kind of three questions remind him. They give him that connection moment in his head that it was three times that I denied you. And I think Jesus was helping Peter not just to see his brokenness, his sin, his failure, his weakness, but to own it in front of him. That was his invitation and it hurt Peter. It was happening on a heart level because it was humbling and it was a blow to his pride. But here's the bit that so, can so easily derail us in this process, and that's the temptation actually not to own it, but to make excuses for our brokenness. Failure to admit either to ourselves or to God or to others about who we really are. That's why ultimately the gospel is offensive to so many. Because actually it's the gospel of good news that says, look, you're a mirror that's been smashed of broken pieces and you can't put yourself back together. You know, that's, that's offensive to many. You know, of course, the good news is that God wants to do it, but we have to own it first and go, yep, that's me. But it's so easy, isn't it, to make excuses. Do you know, I reacted like that because I was tired. Or I respond to people like that because I'm really sensitive. Or I had an affair because my spouse wasn't meeting my needs. Or I don't want to offend people, so I don't open my mouth about my faith. Or I could stop drinking if I had to. Or I haven't really got a problem with addiction. Or I could give more money if I felt it was right to. And actually admitting that I don't share Jesus with my friends in the way that I want to, or that I'm full of doubt, or I'm a control freak, or I've got problems with anger, or I've got problems with pursuing godly relationships. I struggle to love my kids in the way that I want to. Admitting it? It's not easy. It's easier to make excuses. I know we'd all agree with that. But actually, the excuses we make today, they're the foundations of the regrets that we have tomorrow. You know, it's easy to blame. It's blame others, anything, anyone else, you know, for our actions and our reactions. Oh, it's my personality type, or it's my church leader's fault, or it's my colleagues, or it's my family members, or it's the time of the month, or it's my pressures at work. So easy to blame. Last year, 2013, there was a group of Idaho inmates in prison who were suing eight brewers for not warning them of the dangers of alcohol and blaming them for their life of crime. How it's incredible. And there was another chap in America called Chris Sevier who, was, who sued Apple last year, blaming them for his addiction to pornography because the websites weren't blocked on the machine that he bought. And actually... It's part of our human condition, not to own our brokenness. But blaming today leads to bondage tomorrow. And do you know what? Let's just remember that owning our stuff, it doesn't disqualify us from God's goodness and his grace. It actually draws us near to him. It qualifies us for it because that's a, it's an admission of our need. You know, we need to own our brokenness. And then lastly, we need to exchange it. We need to see it, we need to own it, and then we need to exchange it. And exchanging it involves acknowledging it's a problem. It's not just that I can see it. It's not just that, yes, it's mine. It's actually, it's a problem. It's not how you want me to live, Lord. It's not what you're calling me to. It's not who you want me to be. And therefore, I've got to bring it to you. I've got to confess it. I've got to put it in your hands, which I can only do if it's in mine. I've got to put it in your hands and give it to you. And uh, that's, you know, the Bible calls it confession. It's just speaking out. It's owning and, and declaring, I've got a lukewarm heart. I don't love you in the way that I want you to. I want, you want me to, and I want to love you. 
I turn a blind eye when I want to, I want to be that character that steps in and helps. I'm not generous and I want to be generous. Giving it to him, owning it, confessing it, and the shame that goes with it, and then receiving from him his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace. Hearing that word that says, I love you. I don't judge you. I'm for you. I can do something with this. I want to restore you. I've got more for you. And the psalmist put it beautifully, this process of exchanging those pieces of glass that God exposes to us in Psalm 32. He says this, when I, re- when I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water. Finally, I confess my sins to you and I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I'll confess my rebellion to the Lord. I don't have the faith that I want. I don't have the hope that you want me to. I'm finding it hard to trust your promises. I've spoken this and I shouldn't have done. The psalmist says, you forgave me. My guilt is gone. You know, as Peter stands before Jesus, he's uncovered, isn't he? He's uncovered. Jesus has brought him to that place where he's helped him to see it, to own it, but then he wants to exchange it. And uh, he's, Peter's so conscious of what he has done. He's hurt. He's probably a bit ashamed, but he's standing in the presence of the one who loves him, the one who's got more for him, the one who's in the process of making a glitter ball. And not only does he receive the mercy and the forgiveness and the goodness of God, he's reminded of Jesus' incredible plan and promise for his future. What an amazing moment to receive a commission again. Go and feed my sheep. Go and feed my lambs. And that's Jesus' promise to us when we stand in that place of honesty before him. You know, he wants to remind us as we offer him our dirt, he wants to remind us of the destiny he has for us. But that actually only, you know, that he can only fulfill when we're standing in that place of humility. It's never a fair exchange with Jesus. We give him the rubbish he gives us the glitter ball. And, uh, you know, as I said before, it's not restoration backwards. Peter isn't restored to a man, you know, the man he was before he denied Jesus with all that fear that was in his heart that he just couldn't see it. He's restored to a man upon whom Jesus builds his church. A man who declares the faithfulness and goodness of God in the presence of hundreds and thousands and sees them turn to the Lord you know, and a community and a church is born. It's incredible. And actually it's that same God today who invites us on a daily basis to come to him in his presence with with what we see, what we're willing to see, if we're willing to see it, you know, in our hearts, what life throws up, to own it before him and then to offer it to him so that we can receive all that he has for us. You know, he's been doing it for 2,000 years And uh, he's wanting to continue that process of restoration in each of us. So why don't we stand and we're going to pray before we go back out.